elementary school and high school. So that's so the you, pre 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 pet cemetery Cleveland Browns. It's the pre pet cemetery Cleveland Browns, the classic pre Cleveland Browns right there. So if you if you haven't noticed, we're already into it, Sigmund Bloom and I. We're probably like 30, 35 minutes into this, and we haven't. Even and you don't want to know what we were talking about before. We <laughs> no, I'm, you don't. I'm not saying that to be cheeky. You really don't. Actually, want to. you might, but you might not. So yeah, you might so, not want to admit that you do. Anyway, th that's very true. So at that point, let's get into some legal mumbo jumbo, and then we'll get rid of it. I should have the lawyer read this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it, which is. Um, the videos posted here at the Rookie Scouting Portfolio Film Room are not hosted on the server. I don't have a server. And the original video content is not considered the property of the Rookie Scouting Portfolio. The videos are considered to be used under the Fair Use Doctrine of the United States Copyright Law, Title 17, U.S. Code Sections 107 through 118. And the stimulating reading, I'm sure. Videos are yeah. used on the site for editorial and educational purposes only. And the Rookie Scouting Portfolio and its staff do not claim ownership or any original video content. And uh, Rookie Scouting Portfolio and its staff don't use this said video clips in advertisements, marketing, or direct financial gain. All the video content in each clip is considered owned by the individual broadcast companies. Look, I'm just here watching film with my buddy Sigmund Bloom so that we can break down stuff for educational use only. Um, and it's really just, you know four minute to 15 minute long video clips of cut ups of players and that's yeah. what we're doing so you know all good hopefully the um, hopefully those of you who are you know looking at this and scrutinizing that realize that this is benefiting you than it more it is than it's benefiting us um, so with that said welcome to Sigmund Bloom yeah RSP film room number 37 it's always great to have you on oh. man this is fun. I, I I think one version of the afterlife is just getting to hang out in Matt Waldron's film room and watching football, but not just football, as we discussed. Um, our, our mutual good friend Bob Harris, and when he flies, takes advantage of the people watching in the airports. And I've always joked with him that he should publish the North American uh, Field Guide to the North American Human. And I know if Bob's listening, he'll nod along, and he's probably been working on it. Um, so, you know, the film room approach to life is a, a, a an enriching an attention to detail, kind of like Richard Linkletter's films. If you just sit back, it isn't about turning over rocks and digging things up. Just sit back, and the truths will reveal themselves in time. The, what I would love is we could get, if, if it weren't just Bob and I doing the airport show, we could get you and I in the studio and yeah. have Bob on location. Oh, we wow. could, If TSA didn't do like an up close and personal yeah. check, why he has a video camera like hooked to his, you know, maybe to a Bluetooth well, or something. Remember those early David Letterman's when he had Larry Bud Melman go out into crowds yeah. and he would just like tell him what exactly what to say? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what we need to do, something like that. So Bob yeah. can go to Larry Bud Melman. So today, we I've been saving this one for a little bit, or at least that's my cover is. I've been actually saving this guy for the rookie scouting portfolio. Now that the RSP is out, um, the the player that I've really enjoyed watching this year, who is one of my more underrated receivers, is Trey McBride out of William & Mary. And McBride, to me, I've, I've often said, at least in writing, is that if you took Amari Cooper – and he, you kidnapped him and replaced him with McBride, and McBride knew the offense at Alabama, most people wouldn't know the difference. That's my view, at least. Um, I would tend, I tend to agree with that. What's really neat about McBride is it's going to give us a, um, and we could do this, we could, you know, we could, we could have done this with our guy, Zach Zenner, although people are starting to wake up to Zenner. Um, but there's another layer to watching film when you're watching a small school player. Uh, because, and there, there, there's already a layer when we're watching any college film, of trying to isolate, and again, that Eric Stone article about quarterbacks that preceded his Mariota, Mariota scouting report was a good one, where we're looking specifically for things that are projectable to the NFL. I mean, we make note of everything, but anytime we watch college film, we're trying to isolate those things that are projectable, and when you have a small school player, now that is a exponentially more important task because just beating the small school opponent should be the bare minimum you know that's like those thresholds and measurables it's how they beat them and how we could project that and that's again why those all-star games and the combine and the measurables can be important but i think mcbride is i tend to agree with you 
that he exhibits a lot of the things that we love about the bigger names in this wide receiver class. Yeah, and we watched Amari Cooper together, so this will be an interesting kind of one to go with. And and Emery Hunt, who was on last week, we talked after the show about this, and this is something I've always wanted to do. I would love to have a TV show where we would take – all the prospects and really just NFL players too. I'd love to do this with NFL players and college prospects and put them in body suits where you cannot see their right. skin from head to toe and have and not give them a number or anything and just or maybe put a number on their back but you know and have them just run drills and play playing games and people go Wow, what did that guy? What that receiver look like to you? God, he looked like Michael Irvin. The way how physical sure. he was, and how he's able to beat guys at the catch point. Who was that? Oh, that was Jordy Nelson. Right, that was well, Kimbrell Tompkins. Yeah, exactly. Or who is that? Who's that guy? Who who's that running back who's just like running over people and's got the speed to pull away from people? Is that you know that you, you know they look at that and they might say who's a two you know who's a recent 220 pound bag. Is that Tevin Coleman? You know, no, right. that's Zach Zenner, you know, right. that, that kind of thing. So, um, with that in mind, we're going to watch two games from Trey McBride. Really, it's going to be one game and then one set of highlights because there's not a lot of tape that you're going to find on them. But of course, draft breakdown is going to find some of that for you. So draft breakdown has one of the Richmond game. So we're going to watch that first. And then we're going to watch probably a good 15 minutes of highlights of his career. Um, if you don't know anything about McBride, you're looking at a guy who's about Amari Cooper's um, dimensions, um, similar speed and burst, and also someone who was a very good student. His father was, I believe, a lieutenant, or a, I think it was a lieutenant colonel in the in the military, and he turned down a chance to go to Harvard to play football, wanted to play football somewhere else um, to pursue his career. And also, I, I am sure there were other merits to William and Mary, why he chose that over Harvard. But um, you get an idea, a taste of this guy who's very well known as being a very disciplined, studious kid who also can play you know, special teams and play the receiver position quite well. So we're going to get a look at that. Before we jump in, I'll just interject yeah. a, a point you made a few seconds ago. I, I do think your experiment about you know, pixelating or digitally altering players so that we can't tell who they are, and we would have some other level of technology maybe to like stretch them out so you couldn't even tell by body type, by their profile, really isolate something, and I know I'm guilty of it. I may be one of the worst people as far as being guilty of it, of expectations. When you have expectations, it... It's the framework of what you see, and that's what's kind of nice about with the first time we watch Zach Zenner or the first time you watch Trey McBride, because or just maybe a player who doesn't have as much buzz, because you don't have expectations. Uh, and I think it can work both ways too. If you expect a player to be good, you might interpret things more positively. But also, if you've been hearing a lot of hype about a player, then you might be more inclined to look for the negative, and you might inflate the negative. And then I know also Eric Stoner and others have talked about the importance of the first game that you watch, too. So framework is always important. That's very true. And I think also another thing that will be interesting to discuss with this game is that small school prospect angle that you, that you brought up earlier, which is where is it important to look and say that's a small school issue that we need to learn more about, or where we can look at and say it doesn't matter what program he's in. Um, it doesn't matter who he's playing here because these these particular traits will carry over and what you can find from, you know, where it's important one way or the other. Because I've certainly seen with certain positions, small school tape kind of bothers me a little bit more in certain positions than others. Wide receiver to me isn't one of them, but um, tight end, for instance, is mm -hmm. a little bit more problematic for me. Um, you know, so is play along the line of scrimmage and the line of I'm learning more and more through these through these sessions and hopefully you are as well who are out there listening and watching that defensive line and offensive line are diff and linebacker are a little bit different animals when it comes to evaluating tape that you re it really does make sense to watch more and more tape with those guys because depending on what's being thrown at them you're you may not get to see everything that they can do, and they may look one-dimensional, or they may look a lot better or a lot worse from game to game. Compared to um, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, I think that you can they get enough of a sample size of doing different things because the offense tries to dictate to the defense a little more often. So it's 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 this has been a really cool learning experience in this first year, just from that alone. Yeah, and fit 
comes in here too with some of those players where what they're asked to do in the NFL might be a much more determinative offensive lineman, you know, linebackers, the role that they play. Where, like you said, with a wide receiver, um, you can you can tailor what they're asking them to do to what they can do in an offense. You have enough variety in things you ask wide receivers to do that you can say, well, what can you do? Yeah. We'll make a roll around that. So with that in mind, um, we're going to watch this first one. I'm going to pull this up. If you're new to the RSP film room and one, and you're still on after what we were talking about earlier on with this, <laughs> and looking at the two of us and we were expecting a couple of talking heads and suits, then, you know, welcome. And this is just two guys watching tape and talking about what we see here. Yeah. So we're going to probably put this on half speed and make sure that, that my buddy Bloom here can, can see what it is that we're going to be watching. And uh, away we go. Is everything looking good for you right yeah. now? Yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's do this. I'm going to put it at half speed just for now, and if we may speed it up or slow it down. We get McBride over at the top of the screen here against the Richmond Spiders, home of Tim Hightower. So immediately what stands out is just the space. I mean, look at the space around it. I mean, separation, you know. Yeah. And it, whether it's man or zone, I mean, when, with man, it's going to be running a route. But with zone, it's feel. Uh, feel for those spots in the field. Yeah. just come, And he's coming back to the ball. Um, you see that, and it's just very fluid. Even if you look at this, and you could nitpick the hand technique mainly because it was a little bit more. No, that was good. Actually, that was good. His hands were up the way they needed to be. Very easy catch. Yeah, smooth turnout field is smooth. He's a smooth, fluid athlete. Yes, he is. And you can see the size here. It's a pretty nice size. You know, that's 6'2 six, six range, 215 range. Yeah, I think he had the combine. He was 6'210, which, you know, 210 is a nice bulk. And there you, there you see him getting uh, a little bit of a push as a blocker. Yeah. And this is something he said he really needed to work on as a, as a senior. And we're going to see a lot more of his example blocking. I think he's one of the better blockers in this class now. Um, and, you know, there he is going downfield and picking up a second guy. You know, he does not quit, and you're going to see this consistently in his game, which makes him, you know, a really valuable player to a lot of sure. teams this way. And, and just as much as individual added value as a blocker to a running game. And you know, often you'll see those uh, blocks at the second and third level spring long runs, and that's important. I like watching a wide receiver block on his college tape just to see if he's he has a zest for the clash. You know, does he does he like the physical side of football? It gives you a clue to that toughness angle. Absolutely. I love that. And then if we dig a little deeper, I like the fact that he is patient with setting his angle. He doesn't overrun it. He lets the defender come to him, even though his hands might be a little wide of the target here. He's trying to work inside. And then you see some functional strength. And you saw a little, you know, a little blocking sled action once he got his, his push going. Absolutely, you know, and that's that that's that whole thing of using the hips to convert your natural strength into power. And he's he knows when to just say, let me let let's just move on here. Let's go on to the next player here and see if I can get a little shot at him. Well, yeah, yeah, it's like I like I like taking shots at guys. Yeah. Like, hey, hey, look, there's someone else I can take a shot at. That's right. Let me take it to them, and that's the that's the thing you like to see. And it's consistent. You're going to see some consistent work here. And even if you know he does have some drops occasionally, but one of the things you see. There's that technique again, mm -hmm. you know. Knocking the ball out of the air. Exactly. And another thing I like about that play is he presents a big target. He presents a target with a wide catch radius, and uh, there's a lot of room because, you know, there's not that much room between those two defenders. Uh, and when he turns to square up, there's a big, a big range. Marcus yeah. Colson was good at that. Absolutely. And you see enough, you know, I mean – you see enough skill to, you know, enough quickness to make that first move, but still He's get got a him. plan. Yeah. Like, you know, Matt, when I'm watching college wide receivers, first, the first question after the catch is, because this isn't always a given, even for guys that are considered, you know, college uh, pro ready or receivers that are pro prospects. Does he have a plan when he catches the ball? Yeah. And he's thinking it. You, I like that he's thinking ahead. I mean, certainly we will have times that people go, well, he dropped the ball because he, he was already looking somewhere else. To you know, as he was making the catch, and certainly that can happen. You need to look the ball in, but you also—it's a fine line between let's look the ball all the way in and be so deliberate that I can't turn over my shoulder and see where the defender's coming. 
Right. So he's not not only is he not getting alligator arms or bracing for contact, and when that when thir- with thirty four in his peripheral vision there, um, he's actually like a running back. He's already understanding what he's going to do to elude that defender. And yeah. he does, and he does. He def- he eludes him. Now, granted, there's like seven other guys on him, but it doesn't daunt him that there's seven other guys about to smother him. No, and he gets the first down and gets low so that he doesn't have to take a necessary hit. It's uh, all very smart. And then we're going to see if we can get another shot of him blocking in the red zone here, maybe. Let's see. Yeah. Well, he saw something happen there. It was off screen, but he neutralized his guy, and he knew the play was coming to his side of the field. Yeah. This is a good point for me to say. Um, Mike Tomlin also went to William and Mary. So Steelers, if you, you know your third round wide receiver value, this is good. <laughs> yep, yep, absolutely. Once again, you know, you see that aggression. Maybe he comes in a little too hot in terms of leaning into that. Right. But still, I mean, these are fine points that will get addressed in his game that he should be able to address in his game. This is a type of, in, blocking is a type of thing that you should have the the easiest path towards improvement if you're willing. You know, because he shows the patience most of the time um, and he shows the aggression. So he has a pretty good mix of each. It's just a matter of, you know, more experience and, and you know, learning to when to set up and, and when to let the defender come to you. Like that's good. That's good hand placement there. Mm-hmm. And he let the defender kind of dictate the action to let him go outside a little bit more, and and then the runner re- reacts to that a little bit too, along with what else he had going on at the line. That's one of those awkward moments where it's just like. I want to deliver the boom, and I realized I didn't get the angle I wanted. Right. Right. <laughs> well, he's a willing blocker, which yeah. is, you know, that, that at least gets you through the door. He's not going to be one of the best blockers in this class. But like I said, it, at least it reflects that he doesn't shy away from the physical side of the game. No. And to me, that's just that's just more an, a sign of someone who's probably a little, was just a little too zealous. Yeah, and, again, the sep- and again, the separation. I mean, yeah. just, and this is something that is pretty common. Um, and this is one of those things that I think really applies when you talk about small school, look, watching a small school player lens. It should look easy if we're talking about him as an NFL prospect. And, yeah. and, and separation is pretty easy for him. And we're going to see that against some larger programs um, in the next tape as well, which is one of, the, one of the nice things about this, but getting a chance to see just play by play like this and not just a highlight package, you, you know, is is important viewing because you are going to get to see, you know, plays where he's not getting the ball or where he's, you know, where it doesn't work out. There's another nice pluck and right under coverage there. And one of the things that generally stands out when you watch him. It's he, the word that po- came into my head, Matt, is graceful. He's a graceful receiver. Yeah. He, it's it's partially body control and fluid athleticism, but he just it's just so e- easy for him. He, he, he doesn't look explosive because his movements are, are measured and kind of pre- precise, really, for you know the way he times his leap, where he gets... It's high-pointing, but it's not just brute out-leaping somebody... There, there's a smoothness or aesthetically pleasing uh, way that he goes up for the ball that I think is indicative of a football skill. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, and it's um, you know, when you look at, let me see if I can find what I was looking for here with this. Yeah, I mean, when you find when you look at McBride and he runs off, this is a guy with a four four forty, right, and a four point eight. 4.0820 and a 6.96 three cone drill. Those are very good times and a 38 inch vertical. So you're looking at an explosive athlete here. 
and he even though he's only six foot, he does play and present more of a long limbed wide receiver target with his catch radius and his leap timing and his body control. But as you pointed out, uh, if we're talking strictly measurables, he's got the short area quicks uh, to create separation with breaks in his routes. And I think he's a fluid athlete. What What's nice about McBride is we throw around the term fluid athlete a lot. We don't necessarily talk about it in terms of examples. And I think he's an excellent player to illustrate fluid athleticism, which can be very important. Yeah. And this is a nice little play. This is a good example of fluid from really from the stem to the end to the catch point. Mm-hmm. Because right here at the top of his stem, he has to get past this defender. You see him kind of angle the shoulder and use his inside arm a little bit to to deflect some of that and get through. And then you have the diving catch. And what I really like about the way he made that diving catch is that how many times do we see a player make that diving catch, but they come down on their elbows and then the ball gets jostled out. But he actually is able to gather that ball in, and I think he even get, cradles it and uses and has it cradled in one hand and is able to cushion more of the blow. Again, it's just control, you know. He, it's not requiring him to use every ounce of energy he has just to lay out for the ball. He's got enough wherewithal to understand how to cushion himself at the end of the catch so the ball's less likely to get jostled out. And watch him turn. Yep, he turned that, and exactly. that was perfect. That's a perfect description of what he did there. Because the catch is both hands, but immediately. Let's see if we can get it perfect. See you where you guys come straight down, and the ball will like squirt out. Yeah, so he's able to turn his body as he's coming down. Yep, and put it in one arm, and use the other arm to brace it. And you see, even like before this section, where he comes up here, watch him extend the arm a little bit. You don't see what's happening fully, but you see him extend the arm and attack, and it's kind of more of a rip where you have the arm out and deflecting some of that so that he could get outside very fast. And setting up, and, and you see a lot of on his tape, you see a lot of this, like the defender chasing, <laughs> you know, they're in chase mode. Absolutely. They're trying to catch up to what he's already done. Again, the diagnosis issues a little bit here and there. I mean, it's you know, when do I when do I hold back? When do I attack? You know, and that's and that often is the result of you know whether you get hit first or whether you end up uh, overextending. That's asking a lot of a guy. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> especially with the NFL push out, especially especially the NFL push out rule. That's that's a tough play. Yeah, the NFL push out's going to make it so they're just going to they're going to try to throw you through the goalposts. One of the things I like about him as a ball carrier that I have noticed on occasion is it's a little loose, but even with all this movement he's got going on, it's still pretty high up there against his body in terms mm-hmm. of ball security. I, it's just a little thing that I like. Like it's it's not a major, you know, it's not going to be a major difference between him and, him and another player if you're going to be looking at two really athletic ball carriers who can make people miss, but. If you're going to split hairs, that's something that's nice there. Yeah, again, no one within five yards of him. Yeah, and again, look how whether it's a stop route or it's a route like this, he's he's angling his body so that he can make the catch and get downfield. Yeah, yeah it's that um, that Z axis. You know, you got the, the you got your vertical and horizontal axis, but wide receivers' ability to to torque turn their body to rotate uh, is so important for setting up. Not just, I mean, adjusting to the ball, setting up what you're going to do after the catch, even just if he has his head geared to see what's coming. Um, it's all really natural stuff. I don't think it's stuff that you can learn. I think it's stuff that yeah. you just do. You do it that way or you don't. Yeah, and this is, and in a lot of plays, this could be the difference between, you know, making 16 yards on a third and 17 and getting that first down. Yeah. So, not that that situation was the case there, but. Just you and know, when you're projecting forward. And really quick on that one, Matt. Um, the ball's not a very well-thrown ball. I mean, it's not really. I don't think it's thrown 
it's thrown behind him. I think maybe it's thrown like half a beat late. Uh, and you're seeing him be able to execute the play really smoothly as if, and obviously the result of the play is a positive outcome. He seems like the kind of player to me that with a quarterback with the ability to make those throws, get the ball out exactly on time, lead him to the outside. Because if he gets led to the outside here, there's a chance that he can make that last, if that last guy fails to tackle him, he can take that down the sideline for a touchdown. Yeah, and, and I, I think that you're I think you're seeing a lot of his abilities not necessarily being shown because he's not in a tight, executed, precisely offense with a quarterback who's going to put the throws in the right place. But he's still going to show you what he can do. I just think that you'll see him be able to do even more with more skilled players around him. It's kind of like Roddy White has that kind of quality, yeah. and you can see also. I mean, he makes this look easy, but when you freeze this and go, look at the extension he had to make to grab this ball. Well, he just he underwhelms you in a way with the way he plays the ball because he makes the A plus play on the ball. I mean, he yeah. doesn't he doesn't make it look hard because he's so graceful and smooth and understands how to use his body to do what it needs to do. Sammy Watkins had a little bit of that quality to him too last year. There were some things that he did that you just go. That's very easy, but Taj, it looks easy, and Taj Boyd would throw him a ball that's off target, and he would he would spin around and turn and then like create the great angle to just turn that up for a touchdown where a lot of receivers would have just gotten like six yards and make it a fourth and two. Obviously fast enough to get on top of his man early. There's going to be some trail there, but... He comes back to attack the ball, but doesn't quite doesn't quite get his get a chance to secure it there. And we'll see if we can get a replay that's a little clearer. Yeah, maybe a drop. Maybe one time he did hear some footsteps, although he looks frustrated with that. Here we go. Just and it looked like yeah, you're right. It looked like he was doing what he did well in this game, which is making the, trying to make the catch and turn and look to his angle to kind of curl inside this defender for more yards, and he just did it too soon. You know, I mean, that's how I would look at it. I could see how it would be footsteps, and I could see that being a footsteps issue, but I also could see it being it's indicative of his game that he likes to get yards after the catch yeah. as a feel for doing it, and we just saw him make, three or four catches in this game where he would spin around like this. And so I would look at it as maybe a too soon thing, but also we'd have hypothetically, if we'd never seen him before, we'd have to look at the tape and go, can he make plays in tight coverage and take it? Right. Yeah. I think that's the thing is that he's, he's good enough. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. There's another one. Yeah. It's coming unraveled here at the end for him. He's good enough. And, th and this brings up some of the, what we're not seeing. You're not seeing him against press coverage because there's so much respect for him, and that's and then that's creating a lot of separation. He's using that, but then you're not seeing a lot with the um, contested catches. So, and this is where all star games are great because if you if you saw where was McBride? He was at the trying game. Was that right? I think he was. you would get to see him in those practices go up against some press coverage, and you would get to see him probably one after another with other corners, experienced corners against experienced wide receivers uh, at a BCS conference level and compare. Um, and hopefully you'd be able to discern whether it's, does he just not know how to do it? Does he know how to do it, but he's not good at executing it? Um, you're, you're trying to discern those things, but absolutely this tape leaves some things where you would say, okay, but I still don't know if he can do these kinds of things, which can be important. Although would you say that McBride kind of projects like an Aguilar where you're, you might be using him inside as much as you would use him outside? I think that, yeah, I think he does. He's a, he projects as a guy that you could use all over the field in, in a variety of different roles. So, yeah, I could see that. You could mask some release issues if, he's had, if he had problems with that. At that's, least. Right. that's right. You could. And just a quick tangent before we go to the next game. If, yeah. you, want, if you want tinfoil hat sort of like thoughts about um, how um, – YouTube or social media or websites <laughs> monitor things. Sure. I, I don't think you and I have had any conversations other than maybe over the phone right. about Stevie Wonder, but it is kind of interesting that Sigmund Bloom, Matt Waldman, and a Google Hangout right. 
suddenly yields the next suggested video to watch is Stevie Wonder. <laughs> right. So we both saw like in the last six months. It's all yeah. right. Yeah, it's it's okay. right. At least it's getting it right. I always feel a little more offended when Google or the Borg or whatever serves me up something. It's like, you think you know me? You don't even know me. That's right. That is right. So instead, you know, while I think we'd all enjoy a little Stevie Wonder break, we're going to go right to McBride here on some of these highlights and get a chance to see him as a returner. And I'll do some, we'll start with some of these in a little bit more of a, you know, in real time and then slow down the breakdown a little bit more. And there's that, I mean, just that one right where you can see the body control. It's beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think we're going to see this catch again. But body control and taking the hit. Yeah, I don't think that he's a, I don't necessarily think that he's afraid of contact. Um, like we said, like you said, I probably, that first one would be doing too much. That one we saw that first drop. But then it could get in his head a little bit. Yeah. Because, the, because the, next play you saw, the next play we saw, the next target was a drop. Anyway. Yeah. Or certainly you see that one of the things that he very much prides himself on is making the catch, getting upfield, and making the first man miss. And I think that that's where, you know, there's always a line of where you may go, when you go too far, how does that, how does that fail you? And that's one of those situations. But you can see the concentration here. Yeah. You know, we just saw one against West Virginia here in tight coverage that was pretty, pretty nice. There's a little hacky sack for you. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we got that again. That's just an, that's just pretty funny. Let's see if we can see it. Was that like Jermaine Jermaine Curse do that? And yeah. yeah. You can get a little bounce off your foot. Maybe Antonio Freeman did that once. I think at the end it came on a Monday night. All right. So let's. Let's move this up a little bit more because I forgot they show a little bit of the highlights and then they start kind of breaking down a little bit more or at least showing a little bit more in, in depth here. And he's he's not a burner. He's not a true burner. He's not a take the top off the defense guy, um, but he, he's not sluggish either. No, it's like, you know, I mean, DeAndre Hopkins isn't a burner. No, he's not he's, sluggish. I think he's faster than DeAndre Hopkins, at least in a, in a vacuum. Yeah, but I mean, you know, look at this. We got West Virginia here. Right. So now we don't have the small. We can take that small school label away in the adjustments. It's perfect. I mean. Yeah. Look at that. And it's a, you know, I mean, we saw this earlier on the highlight, but I mean, again, just the concentration, attacking the ball is so important, because yeah. when you can get your hands first. This gives you that room for error that if you deal with contact and the ball comes loose, you get that second and third chance. Yeah. It's my ball mentality. I mean, that's my yeah. ball mentality. High pointing is part of my ball mentality, although high pointing also involves geometry and leap timing. My ball mentality is more of an attitude. And what's nice about this is look at the clock in there, 4.45 uh, in the first quarter. Okay. If you are that cornerback and you are going up against Trey McBride, like y'all are running stride for stride downfield, and there's a ball, you sense there's a ball in the air, you're that much more likely to get grabby with him. You know, yeah. when he elevates, if that, when I mean, he makes that play on you, and not just that. What's nice is he makes a difficult catch and basically adjusts to make it a one-handed catch, and then he's combative. He's combative after the catch. He's not just trying to come down with the catch. He's ready to, to shred the, to shed this guy so he can make it a touchdown. Yeah, and this is this is this plus of his game. That's in, that theme that we keep touching, going back to is he multitasks within the execution of the catch point right. to try and get downfield. Sometimes that's going to yield you drops, but he's showing more times than not he's making the catch and getting more yards afterwards. And so there's two things here, and one that I've said before on the show, and it's it overarches everything. Is does the does the guy do what he does without thinking? And yeah. and this is where you start to see Trey McBride uh, shine in that. Uh, but part of the reason that's so important is the speed change in the NFL. 
you don't have time to think. You do what you do, and that's what, like you said too, the layering of strategies one after another after another so that he's ready to switch modes, and it just all happens. There's, there's not a conscious decision to do anything. It's just the way he plays position. So right away we see on this first play that that contested ball issue that we didn't really see against Richmond right away, like, oh yeah, oh, he can go up and get it. No yeah. problem. With, some, with somebody who's making it hard on him, that's not, I mean... It's not. It's, the defense is not bad. Not at all. And it's an it's an example again of integrated technique. You're using multiple you're using multiple things within one scope of a play. And this was a double move that he that yeah. he executed on this play. You know, I mean, and he shows late hands on that too, which is nice. Yeah. Yep. All of that is just very smooth, very fluid. He, multiple he gives, things. Late hands, and you probably have talked about this with some of the other wide receiver shows, but the late hands are so important because it's that it's that much easier to arm bar or otherwise make the wide receiver's life hard or even just give the the defensive back whose back is to the play the chance to recognize what's happening. Yeah. So those, late, those late hands are great. Stephen Hill is a perfect example of a player who never had late hands, and you would see him oftentimes reaching up here about right here. Yeah. He would. Uh, he already would have had his hands in the air, um, and signaled it. But this was. He really did wait till the to the last part of the ball being over top. And it's subtle. And wh whether or not it's within the rules or not, I don't care because there's all kinds of things at every position that you're doing within the rules or not within the rules. That extended arm as the ball when he recognizes the ball's coming in, I like because it's not a push off. It's just a way to keep space. I mean, just you need some space to operate. And that's again, I think, kind of a natural thing. Yeah, and another nice concentration play here. You know, it gets his hands to get a little bit off of this coverage that's trailing him, and just to look that ball in in that tight window. Yeah, over the shoulder ball tracking is it's all very smooth and natural for him. I mean, playing the yeah. position is is smooth for him, which is always. I mean, I'm always going to add a, a point, add points when it's aesthetically pleasing because I think that means the degree of difficulty for the player to do what he does, even though. In an objective way, it might be very difficult. For him, it's not that difficult. Yeah. And what's interesting is this is a little easier play than it looks, I will say, because if, if he had a defender over top and had to make this type of play, that's a Larry Fitzgerald-like adjustment. This is more of a like this. It's almost like the trail old man isn't even really even there. It was like a minor distraction at the top of the break. Right. But then at this point, if, you're, if you have good concentration and good ball tracking – the, the trail man is, is, has faded away unless he's getting wrapped. But at this point, then it becomes, you know, it becomes a tighter coverage situation, and that's where it's a little bit more difficult to catch. Fine. So keeping it secure, that's a little more difficult. Now that's a nice Double move. Yeah. yeah. Very smooth. Well, it's just he's not again like he executes these so there's no hiccups or stutter or anything. I mean, it's just, it's just so I know you and I talked about Sammy Watkins on a play like that last year, uh, where it's just so smooth that it's almost like he when he's running routes he's running them against himself. You know, it's just how precisely and smooth can I pull this off? It's not even trying to shake the defensive back as much as I know exactly what I'm going to do and you aren't going to be able to stop me. Now he's got his, it's over. The play's over at that point right there. He's yeah. got to check. It's like checkmate. Now I'm going to finish this. Yeah. And it's just a beautiful little out and up going on here because the you got the the head dip, the head turn, the hips Everything there is fluid, but because, again, he has that plan, he's got the defender turned around, and it's over. Yeah. And, it's, as, and again, he's not a burner, but there's enough speed to make that play into a touchdown against a small school. Now, maybe in the NFL that's not a touchdown, but in the NFL he's going to get open. Maybe not as open, but that's yeah. going to be hard to cover no matter how good you are. And I'll add this. In the NFL, it's a touch. I would argue it's a touchdown because – He's having to wait on this high Again, trajectory yeah. throw yeah. and like slow down for the next ten yards until the ball arrives. Right, so he's right. given the the safeties back in the play just because of that. If it's a line drive, Ben Roethlisberger throwing that ball, he might have right. to dive for it if it's not perfect, you know. But he but it, if it is, you know, I think we'll see it here. You can see that his gait's a little slower. I mean, he's just turned around. 
and he's in stride, but it's like he's waiting a little. No, bit he's there. absolutely changed up his stride. Yeah. I mean, he, he could have opened it up and easily caught that ball five more yards downfield. Like I was saying, the William William and Mary quarterback is masking some of the things you could do with him in a in a precise offense with a precise quarterback. Now we get some Virginia Tech fun, which is always pretty good because you have some pretty good college corners that, who who seem to frequent this school. The fabulous Flying Fullers. That's right. I like his willingness to use his hands and to continue. I call it framing separation, but just to you know maintain that distance. It's a good play. It's nothing that you're going to go crazy about. Now that... <laughs> I like this play. I mean, the full extension that you have to get here. Well, and I don't know if we'll get to see leading up to it, but again, this comes back to grace and the type of athleticism a receiver has, because I'm guessing that he probably is launching pogo sticking off of one leg, and, and as he's doing it, or again, orienting that. Z axis, so he's turning his body to give himself the highest possible point to to snag that ball in the air, and that's that's a hard thing. It's not something you think through. You just see the ball in the air, and you understand this is what I'm going to need to do to catch this ball, and you do it. Yeah, yeah it's, that, it's that one foot pogo stick where he's going up and adding that torque, so that when it's when he has to make the catch, he's able to make the it's like the shortest. Uh, distance between two points, you know? Yeah. And look how square he gets to the ball on that. Yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. a really... It's and these are all poor play. throws. Again, these are poor throws. There's a there's a throw here that's an easy touchdown. He doesn't yeah. get that throw, so he does what he can with this one. Yeah. I mean, this throw, if the, if the, re, if the quarterback keeps this inside, if the ball is, like, right here... Yeah. That's the whole yeah. that's the whole Odell Beckham Jarvis Landry with Zach Mettenberger thing. It's like, yeah, hey, really good at adjusting to poorly thrown balls. Check check that box. Mm -hmm. That's a big box. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at that. Yeah. That's a that's a kind of play that I remember thinking to myself watching Brandon Cooks against Atlanta early in the season. And Brandon Cooks making this kind of play in the middle of the field and going yeah, he's ready. And again, there's it's that it's the um, it's the release of energy when he leaves the ground, and it doesn't look explosive. It doesn't look like somebody that's going to win a skills competition. And well, see, that's why I say skills competition. He's not going to win a contest for the highest result, but it's employing what he has to achieve the result in the play. He's going to win that contest. Yeah. Ugh. Oh. Yeah, I mean, look at this is a ball that a lot of NFL players would drop. And just, to, I mean, he's leaving himself out there, you know. He's not, it's interesting because it seems like, it's not like he's unaware. You, you almost want a guy to have that, I call it productive ignorance going over the middle, where for a second he just forgets that there's going to be someone waiting to hit him at the end of the play. But he's employing his body control and fluid athleticism to to put himself in better situations when that moment comes too. It's not ha quite alligator arms or hearing footsteps, but it's a way to, you know, it's almost like Marvin Harrison's instinct to always like get down. Like he just knew that guy was coming. He does a really good job torquing his body so that he's not going to be open to these massive hits. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen this play. We already highlighted this yeah. play earlier against Richmond, which was such a fabulous one. But I mean, it is, it's, it's very, to me, it's just very important that, you know, the NFL, the difference between the NFL and college is that they do all these little things so fluidly. And like you said, there's no time to think about it. It just has to be, you have to recognize this at, at a breakneck tempo and, and to be able to incorporate all these things at a breakneck tempo. It's like playing double time passages as a musician. Mm -hmm. You know, you you're playing running running through a, a song at a really high tempo and being able to do all the nuanced things that you could do at a slower tempo. And this is a nice little route against Richmond in another game here. I mean, look at the let's see if we get it here. 
it's got, you know, he uses tells a little bit of a story with the stutter, but then he's able to use his hands enough just to How make does a sharp he go? Turn. I mean, he goes like 270 degrees around. And there's like, does he even take a step when he does it? Because you often see guys having to gather to do something like this, and he just he's just there, like his yeah. body. So it's, yeah, it's the fluid. Stop. That's it's great. The fluid, it's the fluid athleticism um, that re- really stands out. Yeah, and again, like Watkins, like a lot of pro receivers, and the, the hands and feet in concert there too, because the hands yeah. are used to get a little bit more separation anyway. Yeah. And then he's got a strategy. I mean, he's going to try to be productive and be a handful after the catch. And, well, you know what? He can be, at least against Richmond. Now, I mean, in the NFL, he's his, he's not going to stand out as much on the field athletically. But we know from the com- – this is where combine numbers are, are can be especially helpful for these small school guys. You can see that uh, he, he's got the raw athleticism for sure. And look at the vision on this play. I mean, like, I'm really – this is a very creative run to drop down here and kind of feel that coming, staying up field here is probably not the best route to go and feels that open space and yeah. makes that sudden turn like that. That's a pretty, that's a pretty dramatic curl back to the outside. Right. And how many times do we see that result in a big play on Sundays? The wide receiver cutting against the grain. Uh, once, once he's got the, everybody downfield flowing with him. Yeah. And you can see the fit. I mean, this is a receiver who could fit in a in a very heavy West Coast Green Bay type of oh, scheme yeah. in stride like that. But he's also a player that you can say, let's put it up for grabs a little bit. I need to do that. That's why a guy like that's where I think like Norv Turner's Teddy Bridgewater downfield system, where it's timing oriented, but you can still do some of these types of plays makes him so makes him such a valuable candidate as a potential wide receiver one who might not be the like you said the top athlete but like what Roddy White can be or you know can be a very good number one receiver for you and we're seeing a lot of plays that highlight everything he can do above the rim and there's certainly quarterbacks that you can say like to play, I mean, Baltimore would be another team. I'd say, yeah, yeah, you put him at Baltimore because Joe Flacco is going to like that game playing above the rim. But I think there's a lot more with precise routes and, like you said, timing West Coast style offense that we're not getting just getting to see him do those kinds of things. But I'm seeing all of the pieces that tell me he can excel in that kind of role too. That's a great point, and it's and that's the importance of being able to project. And you have to look at this college game and think about what you see in the NFL. You have look, to think. I mean, keep it on that freeze, right? Because yeah. this this corner is his hips are turned inside. He's already trying to cut off. And I mean McBride's re- so in an NFL play, this ball's about to come out on a rope, and then havoc will ensue on the outside. Uh, and I mean, getting a getting a corner. Like, this is what you want to see from a small school guy. Getting yeah. that kind of advantage on the guy that's trying to cover you. What's funny is that the 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 corner kind of lucks into a pretty good spot for this route after yeah. all, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all, and it's another gorgeous like this. It's like, oh, you thought that West Virginia game was luck? Well, let's watch let's watch him do it against Villanova. No, it's almost like a frisbee catching dog, where you'd want to like throw it to make it harder. Like, ooh, can he go get this one? Can he go get this one? <laughs> Maybe that's the problem with this quarterback, is he's been practicing too much with his with with Trey McBride and is starting to call him PD, maybe. I don't know, you know. Because that, that really does look like that. That's a funny analogy. But I have to imagine that there's a there's like a perverse part of a quarterback that goes, let me see, you know, not like really in a game, but like you can have that, maybe even that unconscious whoops, you know. Because <laughs> you've been playing with this guy so much in practice going, let me see. I like watching this guy go up for balls like this. But yeah, you can see downfield, these all have to be high traject- trajectory throws. You can't really throw them with the power that you're looking for for McBride to just run under him without an issue. But the balance there, you know, on this play, you know, that's really nice. And again... He's just... Yeah, there's a another background thing that I'm extrapolating here. He's just so calm at the moment that the ball arrives. You yeah. know? 
he's just it's just all the same to him it's it's beautiful because we talk about a lot of these things in isolation like ball tracking leap timing high pointing technique with your hands uh, body positioning and things like that body control and what he does is at the moment of the ball arriving he's summoning up all of those things and it just it just flows like a poem or again i could come back to aesthetics and grace and things like that when i watch the way he plays and i and i am a believer more and more after watching guys like Wes Welker and Heinz Ward and Kenny Bell i talked yeah. about this earlier you know is that when you are fluid you may make mistakes but you also you're intuitive in a way that you can create opportunities that otherwise seem like pure luck. Yeah. But how many times have we seen him adjust his body in a way that is just really oh, gorgeous he, I, traditionally? I, I mean, I would argue that there's some intent on that play. Yeah. I would argue that too. And, and why do you think so? Because he's watching the ball, and he's got a hand. He's got a handout. You've got the cursor right there. He's got a handout to try to tip it to himself, and he's also got that leg out like a. There's a dance. I can't remember what it'd be. You know, he's doing like one of these little dances where you're kicking your heels up, and yeah. he knows what he can do with his body to help himself. Yeah, I think so too. And if you look at the position of the corner here, the corner has position to the point where he's probably almost saying, "I've got to play defense a little bit here," and at best. At worst, I gotta block this ball away from the defender's path because this ball's way too far behind me, and I I had this man at my back hip. So I mean, this is a defensive play. I almost think it's a defensive play at sure. first that turns into an opportunity. <laughs> and the concentration it just comes down to. I mean, some of it's a mental concentration thing, but again, it's just this body is so smooth and under control. How many times do you see? It's not just concentration and staying with the ball, but you'll see a guy on a ball deflection like that do something herky-jerky, too abrupt, and not be able to do it. And it's just all smooth for him. Yeah. And, you know, these are plays that... I love these plays in context if you don't know about a player because this is a play where I would... Qu if I didn't see everything else we've seen, I would question his speed. Because we see this at, in the major college game. When you see a flea flicker or a play action pass with a double move, that should be a signal to you to go, I can't, take the, I can't say this guy's fast yet. I can say he's, he's fast enough with the, aid of, with the aid of trickery. But until you get to see plays that we saw prior to that one, you, you know, in, in a vacuum, if you just see that flea flicker, you'd have to go, I'm not sold on his speed just yet. Now this play, <laughs> getting the corner, that's a little, yeah, that's a little better, especially to the short side of the field to get, um, you know, it's a reverse, but still, you know, there's some good angles here, especially number 14, who does get a good block, but even turning the corner on this trail, it's pretty good speed. Yeah, it's, it's well within the range of what you need to make it in the NFL, um, Another another role, another team that's coming to mind as we're watching him is the Giants. I'd like to see him maybe be groomed for like uh, Victor Cruz's role. Yeah, I think that's a great. That's actually a great fit. I'm becoming really fascinated with Amari Cooper falling to number nine for the Giants. By the way, that's what happened. We did a, I did a mock with uh, Bill Rossetti and um, Ian Wharton and Shane Hallam last night. And the Cooper was there for the Giants at nine, and it didn't seem that outlandish the way things went. Um, I think you are going to see something like, you know, Jacksonville is probably not going to take a receiver. Um, I don't. Oakland is the team. Like if Oakland doesn't take Amari Cooper, mm, I don't think Washington is going to take a receiver. I don't think Jets are going to take a receiver. I don't think Atlanta. I don't think Chicago is going to take a receiver. So anyway. And, and you'd think. Now I know that we hear all about the Giants GM and and yeah. how much he you know. He's he's in the he's often in draft media, but you know I was looking back at some old magazines back in the day when the Jaguars were a really good football team, and one Tom Coughlin was the coach there, and Todd McShay was describing in this magazine in the old Sporting News magazine about the front offices and characterizing how Tom Coughlin had a lot of say in that front office and was a very good. Um, kind of a very good um, contributor in the role of picking players. Mm -hmm. And Tom Coughlin being a receiver's 
coach in his background, as well as being a guy who is a very disciplined old school guy. If they don't take Amari Cooper, Trey McBride might be that guy that they're looking heavily at. Well, I think it's fair to say that we have a, a nice axis in this draft of, uh, you know, in the first round, early first round Cooper, in the early second round Aguilar, and in the early third round McBride. And this, this you're looking at them for similar roles, similar uh, tactical value additions, um, you know, with diminishing returns, obviously, because of that level. But they're they're in the same on the same axis of talent. Yeah. Now here's some. Again, you see the aggression. The form's not great here against Stony Brook, the Stony Brook Sea Wolves. I always feel like I'm I'm waiting for like Bo Bridges and the Bridges Brothers. And isn't that like <laughs> the old the I, when I was at my grandparents' house and they were watching? I don't know what the name of that movie that TV show was, but I know the Bridges were in it. But were there? Yeah, Sea Hunt or something. I don't know. But right. You got the good. You you got definitely good punches there and everything like that. It's just kind of funny that you think that Jeff Bridges was a child TV star mm -hmm. and and turned into. And the now dude. he's just the dude. Yeah. That who, that's who he is, and they're you know going up for the ball. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that he is gonna again. Like there might be a, a few balls that a, a slightly more explosive leaper would get to that he can't get to. But I'm telling you, in this skills going up for the ball above the frame, above the rim, um, he's he's one of the best in the class. We're gonna isolate that ability. Yeah, I, he's he is going to be a more than competent starting wide receiver in the NFL. Yeah, I I don't know if he'll be an absolute stud star. But he will be, for fantasy owners, this is a guy that's going to be in your first eight rounds of drafts on a perennial right. basis once he gets it together. You are starting to see him now creep up into the late second of rookie drafts, but he is the classic third round, fourth round rookie draft pick who's going to be a wide receiver two, wide receiver three. And let's see where he lands. I mean, because if he lands with a good quarterback, you mentioned Minnesota, you know, if he lands in that kind of, uh, or, or even with Eli or, you know, to, to put another name out there that he, the, the you know, gushing about him, the way he plays the ball in the air above the rim, Malcolm Floyd comes to mind. Now Malcolm Floyd's a little bit bigger, has a little bit longer frame. But again, I think about him with Phillip Rivers. Oh, I would love him with love. Philip Rivers. Love. That would be a yeah, and I think it would be a if he's faster than what we've seen from Keenan Allen, it would be an, it might be a nice compliment. I'm still not. What do you what do you make of Keenan Allen after like we saw McCal, you saw all this quickness, yeah. you saw this speed. We heard Ryan Riddle talk about how he felt like his take was a very interesting take, and I'll just say it was a uh, Keenan Allen. He said, "If you if you use him in a certain amount of plays and give him breaks, he could be that explosive guy for you. If you used him all game long, all game long, you're using him more of as a possession type of guy, which I've never really heard that type of explanation before. Um, a couple years ago, it was kind of interesting, but now last year you you saw more of the explosiveness. This year or this past year, it not so much. I wonder how much he was hurt a lot." Uh, to begin the season, and then there was a point in the season when you felt him really hit his stride and start to look like some of the most optimistic projections were for him, both in production and, and just on a per-play basis, how he was executing, and then he got hurt again. So I think that it, injuries were more the story of his 2014 than a, a, a lag, you know, some sort of diminished capacity to convert plays and things like that being exposed. Um, yeah. At least that's the stance I'm taking until we see what happens this year. I'm kind of I agree with you in that sense. I do think that that kid's going to come back with a vengeance this year. Well, maybe not it, huge. But but he'll be he'll it'll look more like his rookie year at the end of the year. In general, um, I think that one of the misattributions we can make that throws us off in fantasy is forgetting when. A player was a player was uh, unable to perform at his usual level because of injury. Now, it's very reasonable to say, but who, what's to what's to stop that being from the situation every year? You know, C.J. Spiller, uh, where you're saying, well, but when he's when he's 100 percent, wow. But how often is he really going to be 100 percent? I think that's fair a fair thing to levy against, say, Andre Ellington right now. Um, but let's not say that it proves that the player isn't good or proves the player isn't as good as we thought he was. It just proves that he's not 
he's able to stay healthy or able to perform at that level when he's hurt. And I think that's a part of Keenan Allen's 2014, which might have been left out of the story. Right. And watching some of these blocks, I mean, again, I'm not going to belabor the blocks too much here, but it's just another example of him being a little overly aggressive here. Yeah. Watch him, you know, he's, he's, this is what you would call overextending into this because he's just trying to deliver the shot as opposed to control with his hands. He wants to punish this defender. But what I love is that even though he does that, it does back the defender up a good five yards. In this case, it works. And then he does lock on. So, I mean, this is a feisty blocker. Exactly. I can work with that. You and I both know that watching some of the receivers, even some names that might be immediately recognizable names, your your line then turns to, did he put effort out on the play? You know, yeah. did he try to block? Is he worried about is he worried about having to collect his insurance policy, you know, more than he is about, you know, actually making a play? Right. And this is a play where you can see that he's got good but not great speed. Yeah. Um, you know, if he were if we were talking about him as a true burner, that's a touchdown. And that's okay yeah. because that's I don't think the strong points of his game as a receiver. It's you know, it's not gonna be how you use him. And I think that the, you could say the same thing of overall about Aguilar. You know, yeah. good enough speed, but not necessarily a burner or a, a take the top off a defense guy. Yeah. This is this is uh, my best athlete on, on the field at William and Mary. But right. you put Philip Dorsett here, and Philip Dorsett has scored. Yeah, he, exactly. He's already in the end zone. But the difference between kickoff and punt return, I actually think that McBride would be a good punt returner because of his up downfield mentality, and you don't need to be as fast as a punt returner as you do as a kick returner. And and so as a punt returner, he would actually be a pretty good fit. Yeah, you have um, to be kind of crazy to be a punt returner, and I see a little bit of that. Yeah. He is. He's, you know, there's there's different. Uh, <laughs> maybe this isn't a topic we should get into, but I'm gonna I'm gonna uh -oh. go into it anyway. There's different kinds of like quote crazy. I'm not talking like mentally ill crazy. Okay, so please no mental health advocates um, contacting me. It's a very serious issue. But um, there's you know in kind of like our joke way of like talking about crazy. There's like the wild eyed lunatic, and then there's the uh, you know, the guy who's, like, trying to psych himself up and be, like, completely, you know, get emotionally overheated to, like, do something. Right. And then there's the clear-eyed crazy. Yeah. -eyed crazy. You know, Gene Brammel in a bad mood. <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, what you want is a, a, a kind of um, disregard for your health. You know, I mean, you, you already have that if you're choosing to be try to become a professional football player anyway. But punt returning in particular is one that you're. Ba it's basically a play where you inviting with some help with your ten teammates to minimize it. But still, you're inviting all these guys running full speed to knock your block off. And yeah. You, you know, to put yourself in that situation and do it without hesitation. And you're baiting people more in the punt return game yeah. than you are in the kick return game in kick returns. And, and you there, see that here. Yeah. Well, and what I like is, even though he is kind of a long-limbed, long strider, he's got some explosiveness, he's got some lateral agility, and, and it gets... I, I can't emphasize this enough, Matt, because we'll talk about things like his 4.08 short shuttle in a vacuum. Is it functional? Is it something he can employ on the field to create a result? And you're seeing some of that. And here's... You look at the hips... To me, the hips are such an important part of every position, and I've talked, I belabored the point about hips, and it just, you know, whether it's defensive back, linebacker, defensive end, or wide receiver or running back, but when you're a ball carrier, this is the key to changing direction, yeah. is can you change, can you move those hips in a way where you're almost like slaloming like a skier? Chad exactly. Spann brought that up very well, that there's yeah. literally a drill to learn how to do that and and get better at it. And he says, and you can. And would you say that he's probably even, again, just to keep us on this axis of comparing similar guys, um, a looser through the hips than Aguilar? I think he's probably looser through the hips. He's probably yeah. got a little a little more twist to him. Yeah, I think he does. I think Aguilar is more of a stutter, stop, start guy with, a, with maybe a hard lateral cut like that but then not that bend like this. <laughs> yeah. So just because that's a beautiful bend that's all in the hips right there. Right, right. No gathering. I mean, no hesitation in his ability to do that. He just does it, you know. 
yeah. In, integrated, you're breaking uh, it down to integrated technique. Thank you. I mean, you've you've advanced the conversation because the whole thing about an it factor is, well, I just can't figure out exactly what it is that I see, but I see something. Integrated technique allows us to to point at that it's it's the combination of physical traits, football skills, thinking on your feet, you know, processing speed. All those things come together at these moments. It's like poetry, you know. Yeah, when you watch poetry or or rap, you know, or hip hop, you know, you there are words that are used to punctuate a point and also be a rhythmic example of like something that's going to be staccato and very punchy, and it's going the sound of the word is going to evoke the the mood as much as the word itself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they they'll use it to complement or to contrast, and there's a lot of different things that come at play with that, how you bend a word or bend a note, and these football players, all these little things that they're doing, you know, fluidly doing multiple things within a task, that shows a lot, that's a lot of that integrated technique, it's that poetry of the, the way they play. Yeah, so I mean, I think that, and I think that, you know, we can say with great clarity, bold capital letters, what Trey McBride can do well on a football field. There's still some things, you know, we're, we have we've, we haven't talked much about his route running, although there you, you're seeing at least again the physical traits and execution you want. Um, but he's not necessarily creating a lot of separation with his route running. A lot of the separation is just the respect he's getting and understanding how to leverage that. Um, but we're we're I'm comfortable filling in gaps with him. But I think there's I don't want to totally downplay the idea that there's still some things after watching him where if we watched if we were watching another receiver we would feel like we had a lot more complete picture of them uh, yeah. so I, I don't want to downplay that no and certainly you're gonna you know we haven't seen a lot with the hand techniques with releases in this particular type of play you see some evidence of him being able to rip in some of the you know in the Richmond game you see some evidence of him being able to to do some things with an arm over with a chop um, but I, how about and the other things I do like is that he's not afraid to take steps with a good bit of depth off the line of scrimmage. So, again, the filling the holes thing is good, but have we actually seen it happen? Not, not yet, not in these tapes so far. And even though he does have, like you called it with Aguilar, a little bit of a, of a stutter, a stop start, his his feet, his ener the kinetic energy in his body doesn't go dead when he does that. Yeah. He, he flows through those cuts. The energy is, is pivoting and bouncing off of these points, but it isn't like he stops and stops his energy and then has to start back up. He's getting decent explosion through some of those lateral cuts, uh, and because of the timing and execution of them, it makes them effective. Yeah, and again... Just more combativeness. I just like this. I mean, uh, we this is probably the fifth or sixth play we've seen where it's the end of the play, and he's just yeah, he likes it. Yeah, it's like I'm gonna be here all day, number eleven, all day long. And there we get the corner here. You get the corner of the again, just too off balance. Too much wanting to like d inflict damage, but I'd rather have a guy who you can have dial that back a little bit, because I think it's like cooking. Some things you, <laughs> right, right. yeah, or it's the opposite of cooking, really. Um, <laughs> in this case, just very decisive. He sees the field well. He read, yeah, he reads his blocks. He reads his blocks and reads the action well. And again, it's an instantaneous kind of thing. You can't. He who hesitates is lost. It's just, it's just a processing at speed. Your eyes are telling your brain, and then your brain's issuing the orders to your body, and, and you do it. So here's a question for you, and this might be one that I don't know if either of us will have the answer for. But how do you, uh, how do you grade the difference between a player like him? With this processing speed, what's what's what you would consider good processing speed, and what would you consider maybe not quite as good, and what you would consider as bad processing speed on a play? It's hard because bad processing can be a knockout. Um, I mean, it can be it can be something that makes it all relevant. Um, and and in general, the processing. And by the way, I made a rookie move, and I didn't bring my my. Um, um, 
adapter back here. So I'm at five percent on my laptop. So I'm just going to drop out. Be like, eh, and there's our RSP film room for this episode. Um, <laughs> no, cool. but you know, and it's one of those things we talked about. Sammy Coates. It's it's because Matt and I talked about so many other things before we press record. Uh, but anyway, Sammy Coates is a good example of, you know, man, if he just had adequate true processing. It's not even so much processing speed. It's about when the you process something that it issues the right commands. You know, your brain issues the commands to bring everything to bear that you have physically and football skill wise. So I do think that pro processing and I you know it's to me it's another side of the coin of what I say, do you just do things without thinking about it? Um, I, I, I do think that one of the hardest parts of NFL projections are translating how a player is going to appear when everything is moving faster around it. Yeah, yeah. And and that's why it is one of those things that can be determinative. And I, while while I'm about to, you know my juice is running out here on my computer, but I do want to say that's another thing that I think we're we're it just a very just scratching the surface because there's a lot of stuff where we'll know somebody's production or we'll know their measurables and we'll even start to stick our neck out and make some NFL projections and then a player is either a failure or a success and we'll attribute it to some you know his, well there you go the three cone time was below the threshold or something like that but we're not actually making correct attributions of why people fail in the NFL, and I have a feeling that if we could have everything laid out in front of us in like a post-mortem way, processing speed, just those guys are like, I don't know what happened. He didn't even get to see the field. He Some of that stuff's going to be work ethic stuff. Some of that stuff's going to be dedication, but I bet they're going to be guys that just when the lights turn on, it's just too much. I mean, they're just overwhelmed. They, they blow a microchip. Yeah, and I think that that is very true, and you see that in any performance-oriented area, you're going to have that kind of issue where guys are great in rehearsal, but they're bad when they get on stage, um, and just that that added element of the lights on, the crowd in there, that they simply cannot handle it, and because you even see like great performers talk about having stage fright, it takes them a while to get through that. Um, and or why they they do very well on film because it's a closed set but they don't do very well on stage because they actually have an audience that they have to deal with and they can't hang and do that. Yeah. Um, we so. talk about guys being in the zone um, and, you know, and in the matrix, like everything slows down. Um, but there really is something that you're looking for as a note when you see it thing that when it's, again, it's that moment of action. I love how McBride is it the moment of truth when it's time to make a play on the ball. It really does seem like for him, everything does slow down. And it's, yeah. just, it's just him and the ball, and he's going to be able to summon up. I mean, really, like if we were talking about grading like it was a recital or something, you know, like an equestrian competition where we're looking at all these things, he's getting like 97, 98, 99 out of 100 on. With what he has to use on the field, could he have made a better bid on the ball? Most of the yeah. time, the answer is no, and that's really important to me. Yeah, and you have to remember, too, that, you know, people, uh, the example that I just gave and that we're just talking about here about going onto a stage and, and you know, the lights coming on, people go, well, well, he's playing in front of a bunch of people right now, but it's different. No. It's different. The pressure gets higher as the, the competition level gets higher and the game gets more complex because it's just, you know, there are, as a former performer, I can tell you, you know, playing in high school was a lot different than playing at a gig, at, you know, at a dance hall or in, or in, in front of a room of five or 6,000 people and playing a much more difficult chart or playing with a much more advanced level of musicians. The level, the level of um, comfort becomes a little bit more... You know, it's a little more yeah. intense. You find out, you're intense. like, oh, I'm past, I'm out, I'm outside of the limits of my abilities now. Uh oh. But you don't know until you're past the limit. That's the thing about limits. You don't know you pass them until you're past them. So okay, and we're at, I'm at two percent. So I'm afraid I'm gonna, I don't want to. That's drop. okay. I want to be graceful with my exit and say, but this is fun, man. And it's always fun what we riff off of and spin off of. And I think it's, I think it's telling that the poetry and music and aesthetics come up because there's. It's kind of like intuition where you think it's just gut feeling, but there's a lot that you're bringing to bear when you something is aesthetically pleasing. There are boxes that are being checked at a level of our brains that might not be accessible to us when something is aesthetically pleasing, but I think aesthetics are important, especially with wide receivers. Yeah, I think, I think football is, more, is, as, much, is as much literary and, and musical as it is scientific and strategic, and I think Oh, I was going to say, it's always great to make music with you, man. It's fun. 
Absolutely, man. This was great. And for Sigmund Bloom, the great Sigmund Bloom, I'm Matt Waldman. This is the RSP signing off. Thanks again.